How's it? Welcome back. Ready for chapter two. I'm uh, not ready for bed. Gonna have a nice early night tonight. But uh, before I uh, read you guys chapter two, and uh, gonna just pop the kettle on, and uh, I'll suggest you do the same. All right. Get a nice cup of tea going. Right. <clears throat> Chapter 2. 8 is great. Some people consider their awakening period as the first time they fully experience a woman. I consider mine as that first fishing trip to Mwanza. I was suddenly aware of many things that had frustrated me before. Like mom, I'd felt, phys I'd felt psychologically traumatized because she had not let me bath or sleep with her anymore. But now I was 8. It didn't bother me. My sister Patty had made me so jealous with all the attention she got that uh, that, that year, sorry, that, that a year ago, I had taken a hoe and had attempted to chop off her big toe. I was not punished, but then I learned what real jealousy was about. My folks pampered her, held her, rocked her. Dad gave her one of the most beautiful and biggest lollipops I had ever seen. It had all the colors of the rainbow in big swirls. She got to lick it in front of me. During all of this sickening behavior, I was ignored. Now I was eight. I was no longer jealous and had learned that when you mess with women, you pay dearly. We lived out in the bush near Lake Tanganyika, three miles from the Burundi border. Leonard Robinson took me on my first lion hunt just across the border when I was eight. I had dreams of being a lion hunter just like him. After that hunt, I changed my mind. I discovered how frightening a lion can be when he is roaring, and you are totally enveloped in darkness. The ground seemed to shake, and I found myself latched securely onto my father's back. I had been told that a lion weighed between 450 to 550 pounds. I was a mere 45 pounds. I decided then and there to wait until I was as big as Leonard before hunting lion again. There were lots of wild animals where we lived. I was most terrified of the chimpanzees. They would make a great din, tear off branches with their strong hands, beating the tree trunks with them until great chunks of bark would peel off. It always had the desired effect in that my young black friends and I would flee in terror, also making a great din. Six years later, a lady by the name of Jane Goodall became famous studying those very same chimps that used to give me nightmares. She wrote how smart and gentle the chimpanzees were. I, however, knew better. But then, she probably had not shot the biggest one in the backside with her slingshot. I learned how to read that year, even though I had not yet started school. I would crawl into bed with Dad where he did most of his important reading. I liked to lean up against him and smell him. I had to do it carefully because he didn't like it. I could smell all the different smells on the hospital. <coughs> Sorry, I could smell all the different hospital smells on him and could tell what he had been doing that day by the smell he was wearing. I had this book called Sally the Runaway Monkey. Dad helped me with the words I didn't know, and so I learned to read. I had never been to town, but Dad told me that it was a town. Kettle's boiled. Smells like tea. Oh, yeah. Some lovely Earl Grey. Right. I'll let that simmer for a bit. Get nice and strong. Okay. <coughs> Where was I? <clears throat> hmm. I'd never been to a town, but Dad told me that it was a town. Under Sally were lots of people looking up. The people were different too. I hadn't I had never seen so many white people. Later when I was sent to boarding school, 
all the people there were white. I had heard the song, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, and I knew it was because we were going to have Christmas with all those Mazungu, white people. I also learned arithmetic that year, as I had started a chicken business. I had 40 white leghorns and 12 Rhode Island reds. My pride and joy was a huge rooster called Limpy, because he limped so badly. I'd caught him a year ago, biting the head of a hen and scratching her, with, scratching her back with his big feet. I took it upon myself to be this hen's protector, and threw my rungu, the hunting club, at him, catching him on the leg and breaking it. He stopped what he was doing right away and lay down. I was in the process of burying him when mom happened by. She took him, splintered his leg, put honey on it, and kept him in the oven to keep him warm. I got my first lesson in sex education that day. But now I was eight, and all that was old hat. I didn't mind anymore if Limpy grabbed the hens by the back of the head and stood all over them. I actually found that if I chased a hen, she would squat down. As soon as Limpy saw this, he'd come hopping over and jump on the hen. He was no so... He was no sooner done with one than I had another one squatting and waiting. Limpy would be so tired, he'd have his beak wide open and had to have a drink. You see, after my mom's discussion on egg fertilization, I thought that they couldn't lay eggs unless Limpy did his job. So I was just securing my investment so that I could sell more eggs. A 200 pound sack of maize cost five shillings. I sold the eggs for 10 cents each, 100 cents to a shilling. 50 eggs to cover my investment, which only lasted a week. Uh, I'm so glad that we don't use shillings and all that. I'm so glad we use a, a base 10 because shillings just don't make any sense. <coughs> my dog Buster also helped me look after my investments. He was a huge white bull terrier. I hated it when people said he looked like a pig. He had a pink nose and pink ears, and was as ugly as sin. He was, so, he was so very vicious that Dad decided to make him into a vegetarian. He only ate fruit and vegetables, and it did seem to tame him a bit. It also turned him into a giant by bull terrier standards. All 90 pounds of him. He slept with me at night and put his head on my pillow. Since he was bigger than me, he got most of the covers and the bed. Dad said he was my only white friend. Buster would kill all the dogs that came sniffing around the chicken run, looking for a meal. He killed a whole pack of seven dogs once. We buried them under the mango tree. Mom said it was good fertilizer. So when she told me, so when she told me to clean out the chicken house, I told her it was good fertilizer, and I had to leave it there so that the chickens would lay more eggs. So she had to start all over again. Whenever she talked to me, we would sit on the front steps of our veranda. She would pick a pink and white rose off the climbing rose vine that grew on the pillars of our veranda. As she spoke, the rose would slowly twirl in her long slender fingers. I'd sit mesmerized by the pink and white petals, spinning so fast, then stopping and spinning back again. I didn't understand much of what she was talking about, but the flowers were like tops, spinning dreams through my mind. We lived in the district of Buha, with a tribe of people called the Waha, or as the anthropologists call them, the Ha tribe. One man was known as Muha, was, well, one, no, one man was known as a Muha, and they spoke the language of Kiha. I loved wandering through the bush with Buster and my black companions who would carry all of my hunting gear, of axes, clubs, spears, bows and arrows, slings of different makes, and like every good Muha, I had my own special rungu, the hunting club. We made our first kill when I was eight. It was a black back jackal. We chased it until Buster had it cornered in a stream bed. I took a spear and ran it and ran it through. I had never killed anything, and it made me cry. The mouth hung open. The eyes were, the eyes were open but glazed. Blood oozed from the spear wound. <coughs> I tried to make it better, closing the mouth, splashing water on the eyes and washing the wound. I was crying and all my friends stood by silently waiting. As soon as it was evident that I had finished with my ritual, my young friends pulled the jackal out of the stream with noisy excitement. 
ran a spear up its anus and out of its mouth, so as to not spoil the skin, and carried it home. I skinned it the next day and then dissected it. Dad told me what all the different parts and organs were, and then I couldn't wait to go out and do it all over again. Buster and I became famous throughout Duha for our hunting exploits. I never cried again until I shot my first elephant, but I always felt bad. Buster was a very arrogant dog. I don't know if it was because he was such a good fighter, or if it was because he was the only one of his kind in the country. From our house, we had expansive lawns that stretched right down to the road, which was at the bottom of a slope. People going to the hospital would often take this road. If they knew better, they wouldn't. Buster would set up watch at the top of the slope. As soon as he saw someone coming, he would walk stiff-legged down to meet them. They would always stop, crouch down, and set their load, whether it was just a bunch of bananas or clothing or food, down on the ground next to them. Then they would cover their faces with their hands because they didn't want to see into the eyes of the evil one. This had to do with the spirits. Buster would walk around them, still stiff-legged, and sniff them thoroughly. Then he would cock his leg on their belongings and go trotting up the hill. As soon as he had cocked his leg, it was the sign that everything was all right, and the victim would pick up their load and put it back on their head and take off walking down the road. I took great delight in watching Buster check people out. I told Dad about it one day. He didn't believe me until he saw it. After that, I'm sure he was secretly delighted too, but he said it was not right. Dad started to take me... Actually... I'm going to, uh, my tea should be ready. Excuse me. <coughs> Dash of milk. Cheers. <sighs> mm. Lovely. <clears throat> Dad started to take me on trips when I was eight, and my geography was learned through experience. We went to Ujiji, where Stanley met Livingston to buy mangoes, to Kigoma to, meet, to visit Mrs. Kuvarakas, a very fat Greek lady who owned a bakery. She also owned a store where I used to spend my chicken money. To Bujumbura in Burundi to buy hospital supplies, the treat there being a fizzy orange drink called spit. To Kampala in Uganda to visit the medical university, Kasulu for the post, Dar es Salaam for our holidays, Nairobi to get my eyes checked, <coughs> Buhoro Munganda, for sleeping sickness clinics. One day, Dad took me to Nyanza Lak on the shores of Lake Tanganyika in Burundi. We heard shooting, so Dad parked the Land Rover under a date palm with a very heavy canopy. He liked to read a lot, so he sat in a road culvert and read a book while I examined some of some new masked weaver nests in the palm leaves. They had blue eggs with brown and beige speckles on them. We found out from a local that the Belgian government was trying to put a tax of one shilling per boat that fished in the lake. The fishermen were not taking kindly to this tax and decided to fight against the government. Two hundred of them lost their lives against a few men with machine guns. They then decided that one shilling was not so bad to pay per boat. I had found three nests with eggs in them. The firing stopped and we continued on our journey. <coughs> It was about this time that I started my lifelong study in levitation. Someone had given me a small rubber snake. It had an airline hooked up to a ball, so that when you squeeze the ball, the snake's head and part of its body would jump out of the coil. 
dad immediately took this from me for his own use. He called it his immediate post-op cure. I saw him perform miracles on patients who had been bedridden for days. I saw him get us across borders that would have otherwise taken hours of red tape just with this use of just with the use of this snake. I decided to start doing some experiments of my own after the fine example that dad had set. We had a gardener by the name of Serege. Serege was allergic to any kind of work that required sweat. Yeah, I've known a few Seregues in my lifetime, eh? But he did have the green fingers and grew lovely vegetables. I nicknamed, I nicknamed him Igi Shumbu, which is the name of the sealed cat. They called it that because it went to the toilet in the same spot all the time. The only time Serege ever sweated was when he was chasing me around the garden for calling him Igi Shumbu. Whenever he was trying to avoid work, he would spend most of the time loitering around the pitler tree. There was a lovely shady fig tree there, and a great place to relax, and the reed wall around the pit screened you from anyone who might be checking as to your whereabouts. A hinge lid to keep the flies out covered the hole to the pit, and the doorway was a simple opening in the reed wall. On this particular day, I had killed a cobra in the chicken house. When I brought it out, I saw mum giving Serege instructions on what to do that day and knew that within minutes he would be at the toilet trying to avoid the inevitable. I raced ahead with the dead snake and attached it to the inside of the lid so that when it was lifted, the snake would come out of the hole. I then went into hiding and soon heard Serege shuffling down the path. He loitered around for quite a while, picking his teeth, resting in the shade of the fig tree, and then finally went and lifted the lid. He stood there transfixed, transfixed for what seemed ages. You could see the messages tumbling over themselves, getting tangled and confused, trying to get to the brain. Then the messages hit. Serege went straight up into the air. When he landed, his legs were already going like pistons. His, his aim was a bit off. <laughs> so instead of going through the reed entrance, he crashed straight through the wall. <laughs> Headed for the kitchen where I heard him telling Tozo, the cook, all about his experience. I quickly cut the snake loose and dropped it into the pit, then went around another way to the kitchen. I heard the whole story again and suggested we go and find the snake. We all went out to the toilet, and of course, there was no snake. Tozo and I teased Serege about him finding snakes as an excuse to get out of work. My first experiment in levitation has been a small treasure of happiness and mirth that I have carried all my life. Dad is listening to the BBC 9 o'clock news. Buster is already in bed with me. Dad has promised to take me with him to Uvinza tomorrow, where I'll be able to fish to fish in the Malagarasi River. I can't wait to get up at five the next morning to watch the crested cranes performing their early morning dance rituals. As far as I'm concerned, being eight is cool. <laughs> I've done a few uh, experiments in levitation myself. I used to uh, collect snakes and uh, have them as pets. I uh, had this one snake that um, when I used to wear glasses, uh, I taught it to, it would just sleep curled around my glasses like this, you know. And then I used to just go walking around town and people would look at me, yeah, straight up in the air. They take off running in all directions. <laughs> Fluff, man. Oh, that, that, uh, that was a great source of joy. I need to do that again. That was hilarious. All right, well, thanks for listening and uh, sleep well. I'll see you uh, I'll see you tomorrow for chapter three.